What's up, everyone? Hope you had a great weekend. Welcome to a Monday edition and another week of Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Andrew Patterson with you. Alex Allard hanging out for a few more days while Remus enjoys a little more time off. we got a great show today as well. There is lots to get to. Um, it was an amazing weekend. I had a great weekend personally. It was uh, nice, somewhat relaxing. Got out on the water yesterday on the river. Shout out to my boy, Captain Chris, for the wonderful hospitality. Um, but there were some great sports on, and it leads into, well, really, the uh, when the CFL season gets real. Labor Day Classic on the docket for the upcoming week. We'll be talking tons of Bombers riders coming up this week, and a big win for Saskatchewan over BC on the weekend that we will get to coming up in a few minutes. Um, we've got to, uh, listen, we're going to be talking football. We will be talking Bombers, but we got to talk Chris Streveler and what he did uh, over the course of the entire NFL preseason doing it again yesterday with a late last minute game winning touchdown pass he is the uh the toast of the town for the time being whether that means he can make the active roster i'm not sure deck really did look to be sacked against him but we will get to that as well and hey just quickly on football huge shout out to gordy wilson and the winnipeg rifles who beat the Saskatchewan hilltops for the first time since he took over the club Big, big moment for the club. And uh, I'm sure we'll get Darren Bombing on with us a little later on at some point this week. And uh, that will be fun because I know DB is so fired up when it comes to uh, what he's able to do with the uh, with the, with the the rifles. And this was a big, big game and a big, big moment for them uh, as well. Uh, lots of golf to get to. And not only will we talk Rory McIlroy winning the Tour Championship, we will also tee up the uh, Canadian Mid-Am and women, Women's Mid-Am and Senior Championships, which begins tomorrow at Breezy Bend. And we'll uh, have the tournament director from Golf Canada jump on tomorrow. Uh, but just if you know, if, particularly if you've got some young female golfers that would like to see the best amateur golfers in the country, 25 and over, free admission at Breezy. The event starts tomorrow morning, so we'll fill you in on that as well. Uh, it was a tough weekend for the Toronto Blue Jays. But the good news for local baseball fans, the Winnipeg Gold Eyes are going to the playoffs. Andrew Collier is going to join us a little later on. And we will also touch on uh, the Jets offseason. Now, with Remus away, um, I've got a really looking forward to uh, who's coming up on the program today. As I mentioned, Andrew Collier, Mike McIntyre will drop his weekly hit. We'll probably focus more on the Jets, but I know Mike's going to want to talk about the Strebler preseason right now and what that means for him and get his thoughts on the upcoming game between the Bombers and Riders. But coming up in just a second, my good friend Skylar Peters from CJOB is going to uh, pop on for the first couple segments of the program. Really looking forward to having Skylar on. Uh, that being said, just uh, quickly, a big thanks to the sponsors that make this show happen before we do anything. And that, of course, uh, includes Princess Auto. Got a big show at Princess Auto on Thursday with some very special guests. Do not miss that one, folks. Our friends at Cool Bet Canada, Assiniboia Downs, back in action tonight, Canadian Club, the Nick and Nikki DQ Group, Little Brown Jug, Not Auto Corp, Boston Pizza, Breezy Bend, home of the Canadian mid and Women's Senior Championship this week, Royal Sports, Culligan Water, Aikens Lake, F Apparel, Wallace & Wallace, and Vita Health Fresh Market. So uh, welcome to everybody in the chat. Great to see you all and hope you guys all had a great weekend. Um, by the way, did anyone tail me in the lock shop on the CFL picks? Allow me to bury Horowitz myself. 4-0. and oh, It's been a while. I've not had a losing week since that disaster of week one where I went 0-3-1. and 1. 
We were back up to 27, 19 and one on the season, seven and one in the last two weeks. So uh, there's your tease to join myself and Dustin Nielsen tomorrow before Winnipeg Sports Talk, noon Winnipeg time for the Lock Shop, wherever you uh, get your podcast, put in Lock Shop, press subscribe. And Dusty and I are, I guess, well, September 1st is coming up. We're big expansion of the Lock Shop with our friends at Cool Bet. We'll uh, maybe get Dusty on before the games on the weekend to give you the full schedule. But there's going to be a lot more betting and fantasy content coming from the two of us on the Lock Shop feed. So uh, if you haven't already, what are you waiting for? Join us there. All right, without further ado, making his WST debut. You hear him all the time doing, uh, well, uh, really a jack of all trades at CGOB. And I will say this, all time back in the old station days, I think the best intern that we ever had. It is the boy wonder himself, Skylar <laughs> Peters. What's up, man? It's great to have you on the program for the first time. Geez, I don't know if I'm going to get uh, my head out the doorway after that intro. That's uh, that's high praise from you, Huss. Appreciate it. Well, no, hey, it was a good time. And man, you know what? Such a professional, the full headset mic sounding. I guess really in your line of work, you probably have done quite a bit of work from home over the past couple of years, I would imagine. Yeah, this is uh, this is the office for uh, most of the last two years. I got out of here uh, on Thursday, right before I took off to Toronto, and uh, finally got down and and uh, did some real work down in the field, and that was a nice feeling. Um, but uh, yeah, you're you've been looking at it, man. It's uh, I got the the mixer board, I got the big expensive headset, and uh, this is uh, my life. Well, hey, I mean, uh, it, it is weird. I mean, some of the things that have sort of come out of the pandemic. Um, you know, has been, you know, a real difference in the way a lot of what we have done traditionally is presented. And I always, you know, get a kick. I mean, we obviously were sort of somewhat forced into the situation, but have certainly made the best of it and are loving every day. But this is almost the norm now for so many people in uh, so many industries and even a dominant station like OB, you know, with certain rules and whatnot have, uh, you know, guys where you'll come in, you'll get out to events, you'll be in the field at times, but a lot of times it's very similar to what we're doing. So uh, I'm glad you had the setup. You sound like a million U.S. tax free. You're looking good. And uh, and let's get at it. Hey, you know, I, I do want to talk quite a bit of football with you, of course. It is the week of the Labor Day Classic, the back-to-back -back series between the Bombers and the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. Uh, but you were in Toronto on the weekend. Uh, before we do anything, I, I, how bent were Jays fans leaving the ballpark yesterday? I mean, who saw that coming? A sweep at the hands of the Anaheim Angels. And there's so much talent on this team. But, you know, it seems at times, Sky, that, uh, you know, you get going for a little bit. It's a two steps forward, one step back. I mean, I still expect them to be a wild card team. But uh, I, I don't even know this far into the season if we know what the Jays are all about. Yeah, man, it's been uh, that's been the whole summer for the Toronto Blue Jays. Uh, it kind of had a, a slower than expected start, and obviously, um, when they had some of the injuries to Hunjin Ryu and and uh, Ross Stripling went down there, and there wasn't a whole lot of um, you know consistency within the starting rotation. They they have their five now with the addition of Mitch White at the trade deadline and uh, Strip coming back a couple of weeks ago, but uh, they just really haven't been able to put together consistent performances either. Um, we were at the game Friday night, uh, along with Merrick Dakash uh, and I, and we we're taking it in and uh, White got through the first, you know, relatively unscathed. And then just uh, from there, the wheels fell off. And uh, that came after a pretty encouraging start last time up. So it's, it's hard to see, you know, three good quality starts um, in a row from these guys. If it's not that uh, Jose Brios, Kevin Gosman, Alec Manoa, um, you know, a stripling just coming back, it's been tough. And, and uh, yeah, the Boo Birds were out yesterday. I'm sure you've seen the highlights, Huss. That's, that's not a good feeling because they had a big crowd at the Rogers Center too. And uh, they were not pleased at all with uh, finally getting their first runs of uh, the weekend on Sunday. But yeah, just a tough series and try to bounce back against the Cubs. It's another uh, softer opponent, um, but you can't take any of them lightly at this point in the race. Well, I mean, that was the Angels, or so we thought. I mean, and right. of course, I know you were tied up at a wedding on Saturday and missed that epic pitching duel between <laughs> Manoa and Shoei Otani. Uh, but um, listen, there's still uh, – maybe get it out now and, uh, you know, get into September and start playing your best baseball of the season. Speaking of baseball, the Gold Eyes are going to the playoffs. They clinched it on the weekend. Andrew Collier will join us later on. We'll set up this final seven-game homestand of the season and get information on uh, playoff potential dates and more. 
from the GM later on. All right. There's a whole bunch of things we could talk about. And I do want to get to the Bombers. And I do want to get to, uh, you know, your thoughts on the Winnipeg Jets in the offseason, Skyler, before Mike McIntyre joins us a little later on in the show. But, I mean, I'm seeing it right now in the chat. Everyone is talking about Chris Strebler. And he did it again yesterday for the third straight preseason game. He's come in late or in the in the second half and rallied his club for a big win. And, um, you know, if you had asked me about Strebler's situation going into training camp, I would have thought that, um, you know, he shouldn't be planning to stay there too long. I mean, when you've got a number two overall pick in Zach Wilson that they've basically invested so much in, a Super Bowl winning quarterback in Joe Flacco, formerly elite, who uh, is the backup, and Mike White, who made his debut last year and threw for over 400 yards in a regular season game in his first start. It really did seem like, you know, the odds were stacked against Strebler. But, can't, I mean, I'm just in awe at what he's been able to do in his given opportunities. And the guy is the toast of the town right now, if that's possible, when you're number four on the depth chart of a team like the New York Jets. Yeah, it was uh, incredible. And, and not only watching him on the field, because you knew that uh, you're going to see a lot of Chris Strebler in the preseason, and especially after Zach Wilson went down uh, early on in that first preseason game. That was, I guess, good news, unfortunately, the way it happened. But, uh, you know, he was going to get some reps. Um, but what really took me uh, by surprise uh, a little bit, maybe I shouldn't be surprised, I guess, is the reaction in the room. I think uh, Strevy got the game ball yesterday from uh, head coach Robert Sala, and uh, the guys were just jazzed up for him. Um, well, you know what? You know Listen, what it... just hold, hold tight there for a second because I think we've got this ready to go. And, um, you know, for people that are listening on the podcast, you'll hear the audio on this. If you want to see the way it looks, I mean, you can get to social media or get to the YouTube channel because – Robert Sala for the third straight game came in, <laughs> gave his guys the, uh, you know, the victory speech afterwards. And uh, as you will hear and see very quickly, it came to the man of the hour. And that was former Blue Bull Bomber quarterback, Chris Strebler. Here's Jets head coach Robert Sala from yesterday after their win over the Giants. Uh, no, that was fun. That was fun. Yeah. Really appreciate the way we fought in the second half. All right. All the way, uh, all three phases was awesome. All right. Guys, this is, uh, it's time, right? This uh, preseason stuff is over. Mm -hmm. Offense got to get our minds right. Defense got to get our minds right. Special teams got to get our minds right. We take that next step. We take all this momentum into the season and just dominate, man. Just have that mindset to absolutely dominate day in and day out and own your freaking moments. With that said, strap such a great team here what a way to end the training camp and the preseason let's keep this one hey, he's selfish man oh uh that was uh, that was after the game yesterday and uh you just noted it i, I mean I i'll say this I mean, we fell in love with the guy because of the way he played for the Bombers. And then after they won the Grey Cup in 2019, I mean, the the true character of Strev came out. And really, I think, as much as anything he did on the field, created the legend of Strevler. But um, he's a pretty hard guy not to cheer for. It. You can see this other tweet that the Jets put out yesterday <laughs> with a picture of the shirtless Strev in the fur coat with the cigar cowboy hat holding the Grey Cup at the Parade in Winnipeg in 2019 with, I owe you an apology. I wasn't really familiar with your game. A credit to NFL fans watching Chris Strevler in the preseason. We'll find out whether he makes the, the, the active roster, whether he's practice roster or whether he goes elsewhere. But... I mean, as I said before, Skyler, this is about an e as easy a guy to cheer for. And you saw it from Bomber fans yesterday on social media. And like half the Bomber team, as Lim, Ry Lim Reimer just pointed out in chat, you know, couldn't say enough about this guy. I mean, he is still, I, I can't remember a guy that was here for such a short time and made such a big impact amongst fans and the organization that still is operating at such a high level. 
Yeah, it's kind of crazy to go back to 2019 and think about where the QB room was in Winnipeg at the start of the year and then at the end of the year. And obviously <laughs> we talk about Zach Calero so much and him coming in about 35 seconds before the trade deadline. Um, and then the work he did, obviously, uh, to take him to the Great Cup. But I, I don't know if they would have uh, got some of those big wins without uh, Strevy. You know, he's got so many plays that will live on and in bomber lore forever. And then this just took it <laughs> to a whole new level. But, but, you know, after the parade and the shenanigans, I think uh, it might have been lost on maybe not bomber fans, but fans of the CFL, that this is their impression of of Chris Strebler, but uh, man, the guy can ball and he plays his own brand of football uh, under center. There's no question about that. Um, but it's earned himself uh, a couple of jobs in the NFL. And I think if it doesn't have a job on the jets, uh, you know, come week two or three, at least when Zach Wilson's back and healthy, then uh, I think that uh, he's done enough with his moment in the preseason that there's probably uh, a good dozen or so other GMs that'd be looking to bring him in. So good news for Chris Traveler. I think he's got lots of NFL opportunities and uh, pretty sure he's not too far away from an NFL pension too, which uh, I mean, you love to see I a think guy it's three uh, get financially games. set up. Right. I think it's so he, he just has to stick around for a little bit here. And uh, that's some good coin for uh, the rest of your day. So I'm hoping for that for Strevy. As much as I'd love to see him back in the blue and gold somehow this fall, uh, just get your bag and, and we could worry about that later. <laughs> well, and, 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 you know, I remember talking about this on the old station when there was potential NFL interest in Strevler. And, you know, and I had said, you know, there's a quarterback, there's a coach or two that has a unique and progressive offensive mindset that might be able to take this guy into their locker room, into their QB room, and get get some things out of him that his special still uh, skill set um, provides. I really did think that was going to be in Arizona. I was stunned, to be honest, that he was essentially the number two behind Kyler Murray for the majority of his time there. And you know, when he did get into that playoff game, it didn't go well. But that wasn't really a surprise because I still am not sure that, you know, being a general throwing quarterback, he is NFL caliber. And I mean, certainly even in Winnipeg, they realized that they needed to get someone in and they brought in Zach Caleros. Not that Strebler was not a huge part of that run, um, both running and throwing the football when he played in the playoffs. But moving on from Arizona, you know, he had his time in Baltimore and a cup of coffee in Miami. Um you know, when he went to the New York Jets, I thought, okay, well, this is going to be probably one and done just because the fact that, you know, that third string quarterback in Mike White, you know, had such a great performance last year. And I think he showed enough in live NFL regular season action that they want to keep him. But I have to think, Skyler, that if you're going to have three quarterbacks on your active roster and have a backup like a Joe Flacco, a guy like Streveler in the three hole that's able to come out in some particular unique situations or play sets provides a lot more than the usual clipboard carrying third stringer that never gets on the field. And when you add in what he's been able to do, throwing the football in crunch time, albeit not against the starters late in games, I don't think he could have done anything to up his stock more to give him a better chance to stick, whether it's with New York or whether it's elsewhere in the league uh, on a, um, you know, uh, you know, to be part of a team and a, and a guy that maybe gets into some games a little bit more in some unique situations. Certainly rather have him doing a quarterback sneak than anyone else on the Jets roster, I'll tell you that much. Well, it, you've got a point because if you have Zach Wilson and, uh, you know, all the supposed talent and you're waiting for him to put together, um, you know, the sort of career that people have expected for him when he shot all the way up the draft board last year, then you got Joe Flacco, who really is the perfect backup for a guy like Zach Wilson. I think that the Jets have done a great job of, um, you know, providing him for a mentor. And uh, obviously he's played well in some of his regular season games, too. And then what, you know, if you're hoping for Strebler here, what does Mike White offer you that Joe Flacco doesn't as a backup? Um, you know, a little more youth and a little more upside. You know, maybe he could stick around the team for a bit longer. Um, but you're right. Is he going to get in some game action? barring another injury and, and, you know, really change things around. No, but uh, Strevy could jump in there and do that. And, and we saw it with the bombers, right? That it, it wasn't the prototypical uh, quarterback play, but uh, it was sure effective. So, um, you know, and, and the one thing Huss is Mike LaFleur is the OC, um, the offensive coordinator in New York. Uh, we know uh, that family tree is uh, pretty darn good. And that might be the kind of young, youthful, 
offensive mind that can unlock a guy like Strebler uh, at the NFL level. So I'm hoping he sticks around, you know, whether it be on the practice squad uh, or the active roster for the first couple weeks and any more time he gets in that QB room with a guy that's won a Super Bowl and a Super Bowl MVP and a guy with all the talent in the world like Zach Wilson, uh, that can only be good. Uh, for Strebler's career, no matter if he's uh, wearing that green jersey in a couple weeks' time or not. So uh, I think he's in a pretty darn good spot for a guy who uh, stepped into the room as QB4 uh, about a month ago. Now, uh, Skylar Peters is CGOB hanging out with us today on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Mike McIntyre a little later on, and we will look ahead to Goldeye's playoffs now that they've clinched with Andrew Collier before the end of the program. Um in a couple of minutes, we'll kind of dive more into the bread and butter on this show, the local stuff, Bombers, look ahead to the Ryder game, as well as the Jets offseason and the training camp just around the corner. Um, but I want to talk golf with you for a minute. And um, well, let's, let's take care of the PGA live bit first. First of all, I'm not sure if you were traveling yesterday, but uh, Rory McIlroy comes from six back to beat Sung J M and Scotty Scheffler and takes down the tour championship. And... Um, and I'll say one thing about Rory. He hasn't had his luck uh, go his way in uh, the last few majors. He's been top eight in all of them and uh, usually top five, often top two, but not number one. But when the big money's on the line, Rory's probably a guy you want to have on your card. Um, um, and considering what's happened with the PGA Tour, the challenges from Liv, the losses, to have an end to the season like that with three of your most, um, you know, most important players. And I include Sung Jae Im in that because Asian golf is such a big, big part of it as well. And, you know, he is a top player in the, in the world, but Scotty Scheffler masters champion who had that incredible year will certainly be player of the year. I'd assume. And then Rory. Um, and I had to laugh. I mean, Liv's big news drop in the middle of it was Cameron Tringali going to uh to live um i gotta tell you this last week with the players meeting the announcements of the changes to the tour this whatever tech thing that rory and tiger are doing and then rory winning um this was a big big week for the pga tour and uh it ended in pretty spectacular fashion at east lake in atlanta yeah you know rory and tiger are definitely the two most important guys to the pga tour and we've seen tiger the last year he's not going to to put it out on the course and and give that sort of product uh, at least not at this stage in uh, his life and his career um but if i mean you can't script a better winner for the pga tour than rory mcelroy and i think scotty scheffler he can be you know kind of in that echelon in a couple of years he's come on so quickly in his career just like rory did um you know almost a decade ago now um, but Rory is the big name. Uh, he's electric, the 31 foot birdie putt, the fist pump, um, yelling at the crowd, uh, at East Lake there yesterday was, uh, that's the exact kind of moment that the PGA tour needs in this, uh, ongoing battle. And we still haven't heard the end of it, that, uh, the next live events coming up and, you know, maybe we hear of a couple of the guys jumping ship now that the playoffs are over and everyone's secured their money. But, uh, yeah, I mean, this, that was an absolute perfect weekend and, uh, shout out to my buddy Carson, all the, by the way, who, uh, uh, I think when Rory was four back on eight, uh, I took him at plus 600 to win the darn thing. And I looked at my phone. I immediately put my phone down. I'm like, that's just silly. Uh, Scotty Scheffler had this thing in the bag, even though he was kind of just plodding along. And then uh, look at that. So a nice little payday for my buddy to top it off. And uh, yeah, just what a weekend of golf. And and really the whole playoffs. It all started uh, with that <laughs> Sepp Straka, Will Zalatoris uh, battle there that uh, was just the, you know, the scene setter for a good weekend at the BMW and then uh, the perfect topper. At East Lake. No doubt about it. Well, hey, speaking of cashing tickets, uh, WST fan favorite, Mr. Dubsy himself. Dubs came on last week, and the WST bump happens again for Dubs. Single entry DraftKings contest for round three. He had to wait till Sunday morning to finish it off, but won 7500 bucks on that one. And then had put 50 on Scotty Scheffler last October to win the most money on the PGA Tour this year at 100 to 1 and another 5K on that. So uh, Dubs hit me up <laughs> yesterday. He was very, very happy in a very good mood. And he said that we'd meet for one drink, a Texas-sized drink. I think he might have had a couple <laughs> last night. And I know a lot of people in the chat uh, enjoying that. So the big stories in golf over the next little while will be probably around live, although we are hearing that it sounded like Hideki Matsuyama and Adam Scott were almost uh, gone at the end of this. Mm -hmm. It sounds like that may have changed, and I'm not sure whether that has much to do with the President's Cup. Obviously, we believe that Cam Smith is done, uh, Mark Leishman as well, 
And that's a huge blow to Trevor, Trevor Immelman's squad for the President's Cup coming up in a few weeks. But for Canadian golf, I mean, a guy like Taylor Pendrith that's played so well this year, Adam Hadwin as well, there could be some opportunities for Canadians going into that President's Cup, which, um, speaking of odds, I know the U.S. was at minus 330 and it hadn't changed. It hadn't changed. I think it's minus 550 right now. So yeah, they will be up against it. Corey Connors already clinched a spot on the team. Um, but that that over the course of the next couple of weeks, how this affects the President's Cup, I think will be first and foremost. And then we'll see what happens at this live event coming up. That being said, congratulations to Rory. But that wasn't the biggest golf story of the week. Not even close. Um, first off, shout out to Ken Weeb's world. His incredible run at the Tamarack came up just short. Ken did make it all the way to the finals of his flight. Lost a hard-fought final battle. So there's a, the the Weebs World Unfinished Business Tour. I'm sure we'll count down the 355-odd days to the tournament next year because that tournament did go on for like a week and a half. But great run for Ken. But Skyler, Ken Weeb, we've always, I've always said, is has the most incredible round of golf I've ever heard of. And of course, he was doing it with Kevin O and uh, JT and Hextall. So there was a lot of media scrutiny in and around Ken's legendary round at Glendale where he had two holes in one in the same round. I never thought I'd ever be involved in a conversation of anything that could even come close to touching that. But this weekend at Southwood, there is a new contender for the best golf, best round of golf in Manitoba golf history. Southwood's Carlos Zhang in the club championship at the course where they had just had the pros. In Carlos's round, he had an eagle, a hole-in-one, and an albatross all in the same round. I saw that. I, I, I've been thinking about it all weekend, and I, I'm not <laughs> sure what is more unlikely, the two holes-in-one in a round, or, I mean, certainly the eagles happen all the time, not for me, but for better golfers but a hole-in-one and an albatross, the rarest of feats in the game of golf, I guess, outside of the, what do they call the hole-in-one on a par five? Not that that's ever in the mix, but... Um, condor, I'm pretty sure. The condor, yes, exactly. That's what I was looking for. Um, this is just the most asinine thing I've ever heard in my <laughs> life, and for it to happen to it, like an average dude in a club championship makes it that much better, although Ken did have two holes in one in the same round that I think shot 86 or something like that. So uh, he finished off with a 67 with one birdie on the card. Yeah. I mean, what do you say? It, it, this is, I can't believe I didn't hear this. And I guess just cause I was in transit yesterday and I, I I've been looking at this scorecard ever since you sent it to me just a couple hours ago. <laughs> but I mean, the one you always love to see that then he follows it up with the Eagle. I like usually there's a bird or a bogey coming in your future after a hole in one. You got to get the heart rate down. I'm, I don't know how many uh, Carlos has got in the bag now. Like if this is a semi regular occurrence for him, but <laughs> 475 yard par five. Uh, well, let's just drop it in there in three. So um, I uh, I need to talk to Carlos Chung and ask him how this went down, uh, like shot by shot for those what eight holes where. Um, all of this glory happened and then plotted along with, I think, uh, one bogey in between and a bunch of other pars. I mean, just consistent golf from him. So uh, to dunk it in the Albatross, the par five, and I'm looking at the card, I think that says 459. So not the longest par five you've ever seen, but uh, I mean, clearly he's probably got like a four iron in his hand or, or a three wood or something on your second shot. So um, that one probably uh, found the cup from a lot farther than uh, the 180 yards that the par three played um, that he got the hole in one on. So I, this is my favorite. I, I just can't believe this. <laughs> my favorite thing about this scorecard. And we always joke about acting like you've been there before. He didn't even circle the one. No, <laughs> he just basically put this one and moved on to the next hole. It wasn't until he finally got the albatross that, okay, you know what? We'll circle this one. Um, anyways, I mean, it really was the talk of uh, it, not just here in Manitoba, but I mean, Shane Bacon, James Duthie. I mean, golf people around the uh, the social media verse, if you will, were, uh, were on to Carlos's incredible feat. So, Maybe we'll see if we can get Carlos on at some point to talk about it. Um, 
absolutely stunning. And um, everyone at Southwood, I'm not sure. It was the club championship. I mean, you got to buy a round after getting a hole-in-one. I don't know. You got to buy yeah. everyone dinner, a full, full-fledged, full you know, pay for the tournament for everyone after that. Legendary performance by Carlos Jong out at Southwood. All right, Skylar Peters with us. Uh, we do want to get to the upcoming Bomber Rider uh, series and certainly a little bit of Jets off season. But just quickly before we do that, do want to give a, a big thanks to a few of the sponsors of Winnipeg Sports Talk, including our friends at Vita Health Fresh Market, who are stocked with Winnipeg's best selection of local, organic, and natural groceries, supplements, and beauty products, all at great prices with an amazingly knowledgeable staff trained in these products to help you get exactly what you need. And hey, if you're into organic produce, local grass-fed meats, or a great grab-and-go deli with Vita Market salads and sandwiches. Vita, Vita Health is the spot for you. A great local company <clears throat> empowering people to lead healthy lives for 85 years in Winnipeg. Now with seven Winnipeg locations, including the newest store in Linden Ridge and online at myvita.ca. Uh, Wallace and Wallace. Actually, Wallace and Wallace, of course, was the sponsor of the Bark at the Park game for the Gold Eyes, which is amazing. We will talk Gold Eyes a little bit later on because there's more than just this final homestand coming up. Uh, but they're not just the Winnipeg's fencing specialists. They also work with Clopay, the largest garage door manufacturer in the world. And despite supply uh, train issues, you can still get a beautiful new garage door ordered delivered and installed within four weeks just in time for the insanity of the post labor day schedule for you and your family and hey a new garage, a garage door can add up to four percent to the value of your home with 161 child styles of garage doors to choose from there's a style that's right for you visit wallace and wallace at wallacedoors.com give them a call or visit their showroom over on lawson road uh tomorrow's the day i've got my friend's wedding coming up on the weekend doing a little emceeing and I will be picking up my new suit from F Apparel tomorrow, as well as the shirts I order on that great summer offer of three shirts for two hundred and ten dollars. Guys, it may have been a while since you uh, since you dressed up a bit through the pandemic, but every guy needs at least one suit that looks great and fits. That's always important. And F Apparel has custom suits for men beginning at just four hundred dollars. Went through the entire process of getting fitted, picking out the patterns and styles. And uh, got to tell you, cannot wait to, uh, and I don't see that very often, but I am looking forward to, forward to wearing it, grabbing it tomorrow. Uh, if you are in the market for maybe taking the wardrobe up a few notches, F Apparel's the spot to do it with many menswear options as well, not just suits, accessories and more. 190 Smith Street downtown and online at FEPHapparel.com. Make an appointment today. And uh, hey, one big more shout out to our friends at Aikens Lake. A few weeks left in the fishing season, but if you are looking to plan an amazing getaway with friends and family or a long overdue corporate retreat in person, Aikens Lake is the spot. You can be on the water in less than two hours from the city of Winnipeg. Find out more online at AikensLake.com or hit up our pal Pitt Turen on Twitter at Aikens Lake. All right, Skyler, let's get back to it. Uh, you know, we'll stay with the football and maybe we'll finish with the Jets and we'll transition into Mike's visit. Um, 10 and 1. Um, I know we talked about this on Friday, but these games between the Bombers and Calgary this year have been absolute classics. And even though the Bombers are 3 and 0 against Calgary this year, I would be very concerned if they played them again. You know how hard it is to beat a team twice in a row, three times in a row, never mind four in a row. <laughs> Um, that being said, though, there's one thing this team does, and it's put themselves in position to win. I don't think in my life I've ever seen anything like it. Consistent close games, come fourth quarter, the Bombers are the better team, and they got it done again on Thursday. Uh, playing a good uh, brand of football going into uh, the two biggest regular season games of the year for uh, most Bomber faithful. Yeah, I, I mean, and they got a little bit of rest now, too, with that Thursday game, um, and they got to wait all the way now until uh, they face Saskatchewan. It's it's always been tough in Regina for them, but this it just feels a lot different this year. And, and uh, the way the Bombers are playing football, it's so consistent, and it's so, you know, it just seems like they go out there, they have a job to do, they get the job done, you know, we'll see you next week, that kind of thing. And uh, we're obviously, we all know in Winnipeg, we're about – 
four or five inches away from being uh, an 11 and 0 football team here. Uh, they're going to take on a Saskatchewan team that's been a lot more inconsistent. Uh, but I'll ask you, Huss. I mean, they kind of rallied behind Cody Fajardo, and, and they got a great game from Kean Schaefer Baker uh, and a good rushing game too. Uh, Frankie Hickson had, I think, over 100 yards, a little bit of a breakout there. So all three phases of the offense were doing it. Is uh, this the best that Saskatchewan has looked? And, uh, you know, of course, uh, with the opponent coming up, I think Ryder fans certainly hope they've got their A game. Yeah, well, they're going to need more than their A game, I think. They're going to need <laughs> A game, divine intervention, maybe some <laughs> other things happen. I joke. But, I mean, you know, it's hard not to be just incredibly confident in this Bomber team. And, you know, for those of us that have been around long enough, it is just such a 180 from everything that we became accustomed to believing, living through for so long. And now it's the exact opposite. Even in the Montreal game that they lost, we've talked a lot about – Legio missing that kick. I mean, thank God that didn't happen in a in a playoff game. You know, you can maybe you can there was a team that could afford to lose one. It was the Bombers. I mean, they weren't playing particularly well, Skyler. And what did they do in the fourth quarter? They got the football. They had a hundred yard drive to go up, ended up giving up that lead, and then getting the football, going down, no time left, setting it up for a game that you'll win 98, 99% of the time. It didn't happen. Um, but I thought it was the same thing against Calgary in the fourth quarter in the, in the game on Thursday. And, you know, they're just going to be such a tough out. All that being said, though, I also remember going with a big crew of people, sending a couple buses down when the Bombers were 7-1 and one and the Riders were 1-7. and seven, And the Riders won that game and then won the Banjo Bowl the next, <laughs> the next time as well. It was in 2011, of course. So... There is an element to throwing the records out at Labor Day, regardless of how these teams are playing in both the Labor Day and the Banjo Bowl. And um, the Riders, you know, are going to be ready. And to your point, I think feeling pretty good about themselves after beating the BC Lions on the road, albeit without Nathan Rourke. Yeah, and uh, of course, uh, the Lions went down to Antonio Pipkin during that game, too, because Michael O'Connor left with an injury. So they, they didn't play the best version of the Lions, and uh, we probably won't see that version of the team on the field at all this year if uh, Nathan Rourke is done for the year, which is uh, obviously just so tough, uh, not only for the team, but for the league. But it, I think, you know, if there was one team that sees that and uh, it gives them a little bit of life uh, and they have the win over uh, BC, it's Saskatchewan because... I mean, they're looking at going out east in the crossover right now, and, and we know how easy that could be for a West team to, to kind of go out and, and prove that this division out our, uh, our way is clearly the superior half of the CFL this season. But now it gets really interesting because the Lions could start sliding down the standings. Um, you know, they've had such a good start that they're probably still a playoff team. And uh, all of a sudden, Saskatchewan's probably going to have to go to Calgary. And then they're going to have to come to Winnipeg if they want to play in their own Grey Cup all of a sudden. So it's an interesting time because I think Ryder fans are actually pretty content yeah. with how things were going, at least standings-wise, as long as their team was you know, putting a respectable product on the field every week. So um, going to be a fun one. It, it, it's got a different feeling this year for me somehow. Um, I, I do think Winnipeg's going to really take care of business. Statement game then I could see maybe a letdown in the Banjo Bowl. But I just think with all the time that Mike O'Shea's got to uh, prepare the troops for this one, um, and Saskatchewan kind of, you know, maybe riding an emotional high, and if they have another slow start like they did this weekend against BC, then uh, this could be Winnipeg's game uh, right from the start, right to the final whistle. See, I don't know. I, I the Where I stand on it, I mean, I can't see a letdown in the Banjo Bowl. That place is going to be sold out. It's going to be nuts. The Bombers continually rise to the occasion, and – to be honest, the atmosphere is at these games. Um, I've talked about it on Friday. It gets better each and every week. And next weekend or two weekends from now, that game is going to be absolutely bananas. To be honest, the games that I worry about for the Bombers, you know, would be against, you know, one of these uh, Eastern teams or maybe a team like the Edmonton Elks mm -hmm. or something like that because they've done so well getting up and beating the best teams in the league. We think about that road game in BC earlier this week. And, you know, the way they've gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Calgary Stampeders and managed to win week in and week out. That being said, just before we move on from the CFL, I don't know how many people were glued to the tube on Saturday night watching the Elks and Red Blacks go at it. <laughs> I was because I had a four-gamer that was waiting to go 4-0. and oh. <laughs> Shout out to the Red Blacks plus three. What a big win, though, for Paul Apolis. I mean, we all love Lapo. was such a big part of this organization for so long, and 
you know, you had that dreadful season last year, some big changes in the organization. He comes back and the start, albeit losing Jeremiah Masoli was devastating. That seat must have been hot. And uh, for them to be able to get that win in a division that is still eminently winnable to be in the playoffs right now, we'll see what that can do. But uh, I would imagine it would call the dogs off a little bit on Lapo because it's been uh, a real tough season in Ottawa with m- far greater expectations than they had had in the past. Yeah, it's it's kind of been hard to watch. And I uh, was uh, at a wedding Saturday night, so I didn't have to subject myself to that football game, <laughs> sadly. But, uh, <laughs> man, uh, it, it was just really took me by surprise. And we can th- sit here and talk all day about what this team might have been with Jeremiah Masoli fully healthy, uh, you know, at least up until this point of the season, because, yeah, I mean, Ottawa gets this win and now all of a sudden they're sniffing, you know, the playoffs again. And and nobody has really showed for two, three weeks at a time in the East that they can be the the alpha dog. So uh, I don't know <laughs> what Ottawa's chances are of uh, getting to Mosaic um, in late November. But uh, I mean, hey, to have the start and, and the expectations you have maybe when they're one and six, uh, midpoint in the season, and you're just hoping this thing ends sooner rather than later as a Red Blacks fan. Maybe if they could put something together here, it's kind of the opposite of what they had going into the season with high expectations. It really couldn't get any worse, and um, there might be some bright spots yet for Ottawa. And, and certainly, I think a lot of us in Winnipeg are hoping that uh, for Paul Lapalise, one of the great guys in the league for sure. So, uh, yeah, it was really nice to see. I woke up Sunday morning, and I saw they got that W, and I was uh, I was quite <laughs> pleased about that. I was talking to Nielsen yesterday just uh, about a bunch of stuff. And he's like, man, 4-0. I mean, I still it was a ballsy pick taking Ottawa, you know, on the road after that home loss to, to Edmonton. I said, dude, this is the way that it's happening. What could be more appropriate than Ottawa and Edmonton in a home-and-home home series, both completely shitting the bed at home and sending <laughs> everybody home miserable? It's exactly what happened the week before in Ottawa. And it happened again in Edmonton yesterday. Um, but uh, we'll uh, get to some, we'll get to the Labor Day picks in the lock shop tomorrow. I'm really looking forward to that. All right. I do want to get to the Jets with you. We've sort of saved it to the end because honestly, coming out of last week and this weekend has not been a lot to talk about. But um, what do you make of where the Jets are in this offseason? I mean, I mean, for me, I mean, I still think there's a ton of talent on this club. And I think the potential is there that they could. And, you know, the players that, you know, the Jets have right now could be much better. But how surprised are you that we haven't seen really any significant changes at all over the course of the offseason, considering what the organization, the general manager had to say, coming off the heels of a really disappointing campaign that also included some very interesting end-of-season statements from a number of players on the team, including the departed Paul Stastny. Yeah, well, you know, ever since uh, Mark Shifley came out uh, with Sarah Orleski and, and had that seven-minute sit-down uh, just ahead of his time at the Manitoba Open a couple weeks ago, it it kind of felt like, you know, the dust had settled and we're going to get to training camp now and we're just going to have to see what happens. But the Colorado mm-hmm. Avalanche are still clearly the class of uh, at least the Western Conference, if not the league. They have a great chance to run it back. Uh, they're in the Central Division. And you look at some of the other teams that have been, you know, consistently good over the last couple of years. And I'd put Minnesota in that conversation too, uh, although they've made some pretty big changes. And, you know, it just, you, it makes you wonder what the Jets maybe came into the off season with as far as a plan, you know, trying to compete um, with some of these upper echelon teams in the central. And, you know, maybe things just really didn't shake out their way. A free agent signs elsewhere, or, uh, you know, maybe a trade fell through or something like that. But it just seemed really interesting that, you know, you could feel the temperature in this city is it, it ever since I've been here, Huss, almost four years, this is as hot as it's been, um, you know, surrounding the hockey club. And uh, they were really content with just standing pat and Kevin Cheveldayoff uh, has an extension in place too. And that was, uh, you know, the first, you know, piece of news basically as part of the off season uh, was that he was coming back for three more years. So I thought it was, you know, really interesting and clearly the front office and um, you know ownership has a lot of belief in those guys in the team, uh, those guys making the big salaries, and uh, they're going to have to go out on the ice and show it, or else it can be uh, you know a really disastrous winter for the Jets, and uh, then the trade deadline will get that much more interesting. Yeah, the one thing, um, listen, I mean, I know they've got confidence in Hellebuck, and they've got confidence in Kyle Connor and Nikolai Ehlers, and and 
an engaged Mark Shifley, one that sounded like he did with with Sarah Orleski, that, you know, very a far cry from the guy we saw at the end of the season around. I mean, mm-hmm. that's exactly what they need. And he's the most important guy to me of the entire mix. I mean, outside of Hellebuck, obviously, because if Mark Shifley is at his best and he's got a lot to play for right now, I mean, he's going into the final two years of this contract. If he's looking to get the big raise and get one more final deal, I mean, now's the time to do it. He's capable of being the change maker, not by himself, um, but look, I think can really lead the way. And I think part of the things that didn't happen last year with his play was, was sort of damaging to the team overall. The Wheeler situation is fascinating to me, though, because, you know, we heard Kevin Sheveldayoff use the, 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 the term legacy contract at the end. And then all of a sudden there was all sorts of talk that, you know, Blake Wheeler was being shopped around and that he was down with the trade, too. Of course, he, you know, had a five team no trade list. And and then that sort of fizzled. I mean, he went from number two on the daily face off trade bait board to not there. And I'm I'm fascinated about his situation coming in, in that um, you know, I think we all realize how difficult it is to move money right now. I mean, Max Pacioretty got traded for nothing with one year left on his deal. I mean, it was gonna be easier said than done. But the way that is handled. Um, and the way Blake Wheeler, who I have every intention of knowing, I mean, there's no one will ever, ever question his commitment to what he's doing when he's on the ice each and every day. Um, but I'm fascinated to see whether under Rick bonus, there is, you know, any significant change of the leadership group at all, or whether they come back with the same group of Blake Wheeler wearing the C and Mark Shifley and Josh Morrissey as the A's, um, or whether, Everyone sort of comes in with a clean slate and Rick Bonus um, will make those decisions afterwards. I mean, to me, that's the most intrigued. Barring any other change to the roster beforehand, that to me will be the biggest story when we get to training camp in a few weeks. Well, Rick Bonus is the X factor for the Winnipeg Jets, right? He's he's their biggest move of the offseason and it was a move they had to make because they were on the market for a new coach. And we all know how that went down, and it maybe wasn't the first pick for Kevin Cheveldayoff uh, in terms of who he'd want behind the bench, but he's the guy now. And, um, you know, it, it, the one unfortunate thing for Rick and a guy that's so well respected in the hockey world and um, is that, uh, you know, people are going to be looking for the next guy pretty soon after, just given where he's at in his career. And obviously, uh, I think a lot of us were just wondering if he'd even come back um, at the end of this last season. Um, a guy that, uh, you know, wants to prove that he's still uh, a good leader in the room and uh, a good hockey mind. And he's done that throughout his career. So it'll be interesting to see what he gets out of Mark Shifley and Blake Wheeler. And I know uh, he hadn't had those tough conversations with Shifley, um, at least at the time that he was talking to Sarah or Mark's not letting on as much maybe too. But, um, you know, once it gets past the X's and O's and, and we really get into seeing uh, who's driving the room, um, you know, in the intermissions before the games, you know, maybe after a tough loss, who's that first voice speaking up and, and what the tone of that voice is. Uh, it's going to be certainly interesting because uh, I think a lot of the guys on the team are going to have a lot of respect for Rick bonus playing against him in the central division for the last number of years uh, for the longer tenured jets. And um, you know, a guy that's been around the game uh, basically for his entire life. So uh, it's, it's really going to be interesting, but uh, you know, given everything that happened with Barry trots, uh, probably the best next man up for the jets was Rick bonus. Yeah, I, I agree. And I just think that, you know, Bonus has an aura of positivity around him that I mean, you speak mm-hmm. with former players. I mean, they absolutely love this guy. And, um, you know, Paul Maurice was here for so long. I mean, we don't need to relitigate uh, maybe if he overstayed his welcome or how everything ended. I certainly think Dave Lowry was put in a horrible situation last season because of how quickly that happened without really any other options. And I'm not sure that was fair to him or particularly some players on the team. But if Rick bonus can get everybody pulling on the same rope, if you will, and playing as a team and, and everybody engaged, you know, maybe this team can um, be better, certainly better than the team that was last year, albeit on paper, they might not be as strong with the loss of Paul Stassi and obviously Andrew Kopp moving on. Um, But he will have the opportunity to, you know, to, to get things changed around. And we'll see what happens. But to me, Skylar, I'm not sure whether you agree with this or not. Uh, We've talked a lot about, oh, this is a two-year window right now for the club. To me, this is a one-year window. And even maybe less than one year because 
you know, the Jets are going to find out quickly, I think, you know, how competitive they are this season, you know, based on what they did and didn't do in this off season. Um, you know, if you realize that things aren't going well for the club or if they're not going to be a playoff team, many of the decisions that we thought might happen this summer almost have to happen or be addressed before the trade deadline. Because, you know, if you're trading a player like Pierre Dubois, like Pierre-Luc Dubois, or a Mark Scheifele or somebody that has, you know, one more year on their contract, that second playoff run with the team they're trading to, I think, provides big, big value for Winnipeg. And, I mean, it's hard to ignore the fact that there is going to be a significant change at some point in the next two years for this team because of how many players that they have basically on the same schedule ending team control the year after this. Yeah, I was just going to say that. I think you'll find out really quickly what the Winnipeg Jets are as a hockey club this year. And if it's not positive and they don't get off to a at least a solid October and November where they're competing in games and, and hanging with, you know, some of those tougher teams in the Central Division, then there's going to be a lot of pressure on the front office. Uh, and Rick Bonus, unfortunately, is coming in as the brand new coach um, because there's no... There's no silver bullet. Nobody's coming back, um, you know, in the middle of the season to save you or anything like this. This is the team you want to roll out this year and you want to be competitive and you think you can still challenge in the playoffs. Well, these guys have to prove it. Um, so it's going to be really interesting to see how the Jets start um, with the new voice in the room and Rick Bonus. And then, like you said, uh, if it's not that good and, and we get into uh, February and March and those names start getting floated around. I just don't know how much leverage the Jets will have. And uh, maybe the return on investment isn't as strong if they do decide to move on from these guys. So it's a tough spot for the Jets. Um, but I do think, uh, and I don't know this for sure, but I think those players in the room, especially the guys making a lot of the money right now, uh, they understand uh, their responsibility in trying to turn this thing around. So, um, I mean, the first three, four months of the season are going to be just very interesting game in and game out. And, um, you know, if the Jets get on some sort of a three, four, five game losing skid, uh, you're going to hear from it pretty quickly. Yeah, um, and I'm, as I said, bottom line is I can't wait to, to get the team back here. I can't wait to get to the rink and see what happens. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that I think many of us, myself included, kind of expected to happen or you know, maybe change things up this year. And it's a very interesting um, route that they've taken to get to this point and you know what happens early on in the season um you know maybe makes more changes or maybe we all look like idiots for being so uh so <laughs> worried over the course of uh, of august and say ah, they knew what they were doing all along i guess we will see skyler this has been awesome um fill people in i always enjoy jumping on with you when you're filling on the cgob sports show when you do that but you really are the utility man right now for the superstation to let people know uh, when they can hear you and uh, all the things that you're doing over at 680. Well, pretty much every half hour, uh, uh, either at the bottom or the top of the hour, you'll hear me in the news um, with Sarah McCarthy during the day and, and Julie Buckingham uh, later on in the afternoon as well. So uh, that's my uh, my so-called day job. But yeah, if they call on my number to uh, you know fill in for Cam Poitras on Jets at noon or uh, for uh, Christian O'Mell on the sports show, I'm uh, always picking up the phone, that's for sure. So uh, just tune in to 680 AM once in a while, and uh, I'm sure you'll hear my voice after a couple minutes. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, I was uh, I was really pumped that the schedule worked out to uh, to get you on. I mean, I uh, always loved uh, talking sports with you back in the old days when you've been doing that show, and it's great to have you on Winnipeg Sports Talk for the first time. And unlike radio, a great opportunity for you to show off that duster to the sports fans <laughs> of Winnipeg on the internet. <laughs> just, uh, just lucky I had that wedding over the weekend and I got things cleaned up. Um, or else uh, I don't know what kind of version you would have seen from me uh, on this Monday afternoon, but uh, this is about as good as it gets. So if, if this doesn't satisfy folks, I don't know what will. Oh, geez. I, I can imagine the, uh, the inbox, the DMS are going to be loaded after this appearance. <laughs> uh, ladies, you know where to slide at. Uh, uh, what, what is your Twitter? Is it at Skylar Peters? Uh, Skylar A. Peters. Skylar Peters has Skyler been taken for my Peters. whole life, and it's just devastating. <laughs> there you go. Hey, follow him on Twitter as well. Skylar, thanks so much for doing this, man. Now, hopefully we can do it again sometime, but really appreciate you jumping on today. Oh, thanks for the invite. Anytime, Huss. My pleasure. Right on. There it is. The uh, Our great friend Skylar Peters, who uh, cut his teeth doing uh, doing the interning over at the old station. And uh, listen, that was a hell of a debut filling in for Remo and I said what the heck we have such a great conversation and so much to talk about we can uh, go the first couple segments here on Winnipeg Sports Talk that being said Mike McIntyre is coming up in just a minute um, 
quick hydration break before Mike comes in. And of course, when we're talking water in Winnipeg, we're talking about Culligan Water, the experts in Winnipeg, family owned for over 65 years. Culligan has everything that you need. Water prod, uh, softeners, filters, bottled water coolers, whole home systems and drinking water systems, not to mention citywide water delivery services and commercial and industrial water products and solutions. Whether it's for the home, the cottage or the business, Culligan has you covered. Visit them at 1200 Sergeant Avenue. 694-5180 on the horn or find out everything they can do for you and your family at drinkculligan.com. Um, our friends at Royal Sports are ready for hockey season. I was out with Greg yesterday. Uh, obviously, if you have a hockey player, uh, tryouts are happening right now. The season's just around the corner and Royal has been the heavyweight champion of all things hockey for over 35 years. Maybe the best thing about Royal is all the hockey players they have on staff which will help you and your family members get exactly what you need and set up to uh, have peak performance for the upcoming season. Now, they've also got all sorts. I mean, people were asking me about where I got that Winnipeg Whips hat. That was at Royal. They did some small runs of those. For you old schoolers, um, check out their Instagram at Royal Sports Pembina because over the weekend, they dropped, uh, remember the old hockey brands, Yofa or Jofa, Canadian, titan uh there's all sorts of new merch celebrating those incredible hockey brands of our youth those are there not to mention tons of nfl merch coming in by the day for kickoff just around the corner royal sports has everything that you need whether you're playing or cheering 750 pemina highway and on instagram royal sports pemina give them a follow latest merchandise drops there and sale information i can tell you a big tent sale coming up just around the corner in early September. Uh, great day to hit a Boston pizza tonight. Uh, Blue Jays and more. And of course, coming into the weekend for the Labor Day Classic. If you're not making it to the game, there's nowhere better to get together with the gang and watch the game. Big screen, big sound, and great specials all week long at Boston Pizza. Of course, if you are staying home, you can always check out their game day deals uh, and order online at Boston pizza.com and uh, as i mentioned right off the bat our friends at breezy bend so happy to be welcoming in the top female golfers in canada for the mid am and senior cha national championships first round is tomorrow we'll have the tournament director from golf canada on the show uh the uh, tee off beginning at 7 30 a.m to about one o'clock and again on wednesday final round on thursday free admission so uh, if you want to come and see some of the top females swing it get on out to breezy bend this weekend uh, this week and we'll have more information tomorrow on the program find out more on breezy bend at breezybend.ca all right gold eyes heading to the playoffs andrew collier later on the program right now though let's welcome in mike mcintyre from the winnipeg free press mike what's going on how was your weekend Weekend was great and funny that you're having Andrew on. I just actually got off the phone with Andrew a bit ago. I'm writing a Gold Eyes column today on the uh, their long-awaited return to the playoffs. Good to see the fish uh, after a, a few tough years, COVID and whatnot, uh, getting back to that big stage. But yeah, the weekend was good. Huss, we're getting ready for some home renos later this week. Uh, painting. Uh, you're not going to be able to see this beautiful blue for much longer. It's uh, it's going away. Uh, we're painting. We got Piper oh, here. Piper. Uh, life is good. Yeah, putting new flooring in as well uh, over the next uh, couple weeks. So lots going on in the McIntyre household. Not a lot going on in the Winnipeg. Hi, Piper. Yes, you're a good girl. <laughs> yes. Not a whole lot going on in the uh, Winnipeg Jets organization. You know, it was a week ago we said. Maybe when we talk this week, there'll have been something. And <laughs> uh, and there's been nothing. Even Piper's wondering what's going on with the Jets. Yeah, you know, um, yeah, I was just talking about it with Skylar Peters. And I guess at this point, I mean, you know, listen, I don't want to come here every single day. And he likes just getting absolutely assaulted by Piper. There's a lot of love on the screen right now. This is, one, this is wonderful. <laughs> Uh, the dogs can always brighten up everybody's day. This is good. Everyone's down. The Jets haven't done anything. Let's bring in a cute dog to get spirits up right now. Um, 
you know, in, in reality, I mean, I guess, does this just come down to Rick Bonus has to be the guy to get much more of all these players that, you know, as a collective disappointed last season? Um, or are we like, are you still holding out any expectations that we'll see some changes? I still can't wrap my head around how they go in yeah. with the amount of blue liners they have. We've talked about the waiver situation for some younger players. Where's a spot for Hanela? What about Dylan Sandberg when you have this much money? Uh, you know, um, allocated to the veterans that started the season last year, Logan Stanley in the mix as well. But um, I mean, are we foolish for continually having this conversation or we should start talking about training camp with this group and then they can figure it out how the heck they're going to make it work and uh, what happens with guys getting sent down and whatnot. Yeah. I mean, and you know, I still do expect a move or two when it comes to the blue line Huss, but I suppose if you're the jets, you know, you don't have to make the move at the start of training camp or prior to training camp, I guess you could wait and see maybe what happens with some other teams. Maybe, maybe there's teams out there that thought they had a little more on the blue line. And then they realize, you know what, we, we could really use a move or, or injuries, right. Happen in the preseason uh, teams suddenly get a need that maybe they didn't think existed. So, you know, the, the decisions in terms of waivers and, you know, potentially losing a guy like Johnny Kovacevic or Leon Gavanke, if, you know, if they do have to send those guys down, uh, they don't have to do that till a day or so before the uh, regular season starts. So they do have the benefit of time. And I guess if you're Kevin Chevaldeoff, maybe you hope you can take advantage of another team that has a need that suddenly uh, c- comes up and, uh, you know, you, you reap the reward for that. It's interesting, Hasai, since we last talked, I had a, a long conversation last week with Cole Perfetti. Great chat with the young man. Um, and, you know, he he shared with me, and I know you've talked to Cole as well. Uh, he's had a number of conversations with with Rick Bonus, And certainly to listen to Cole Perfetti talk and kind of passing on some of what he heard from Rick Bonus, it does seem to be that you know, the the kids, if you will, the young players are going to get a real opportunity, at least when it comes to forwards. So, you know, we talk <laughs> about Cole Perfetti, David Gustafson, you know, by not re-signing Paul Stasny, um, perhaps a guy like David Gustafson gets a longer look. And yet, again, when we turn to the blue line and you look at how crowded it is with veterans on fairly big tickets, you just don't see that same opportunity right now for the young defensemen, which I think, you know, look at last year's Manitoba Moose team. That was the strength of, of the, the, the system, right? There were times Mark Morrison would put three defensemen on the power play because they had so many quality blue liners. These are guys knocking at the door. And so to go back to your original question, I I will be stunned absolutely stunned if a blue liner or two of the veteran uh, ilk aren't moved out of here before the puck drops against the New York Rangers in mid-October uh, for that reason alone. The uh, patience has always been something that has been associated with the Jets and with Kevin Dayoff. Yes. Um, fans, by definition, are impatient. Media often impatient as well, but right. <laughs> I mean, do you think that the Jets are in a position where they've tried to do everything they can and it just doesn't make sense for them and they're going in this way? Or as I have speculated, and maybe this is the optimistic part of me from a Jets fan's part, that the patience of Kevin Sheveldayoff could potentially pay off because they still have these assets, because they have a little bit of cap room and Right. Chevy is basically in a staring contest with a bunch of general managers on getting what he wants for what he's going to be trading. Um, and if that takes two weeks into training camp, if they need to wait two weeks into the season, they're going to sit there and they'll make the deal that makes the most sense for them at that time. That could be overplaying your hand. We'll see where that ends you when you got to right. send guys back to the Manitoba Moose. But is there something to be said for that? Yeah, and it is the Kevin Shovel Day off and the True North way. In a way, Haas, you're bang on there. I mean, we just look traditionally at at how Kevin Shovel Day off has handled, you know, personnel matters, um, and and he doesn't usually show his hand, and he also doesn't usually rush into anything. And I think you could probably trot out 
some examples where that's paid off in a in a significant way. The other thing, I mean, I t- we talk about injuries, of course, and other teams having injuries that that could create um, you know opportunities for a trade that aren't there. Of course, the flip side is the Jets themselves could run into injury issues, and you know maybe what they think they have on the blue line isn't ultimately what they truly have to start the season. So you know, in that sense, patience could be a virtue for sure. And I think if you take a poll of general managers, I mean, and ask them, you know, historically, what are some of the moves you regret? I think you'd get, you know, if if they were being truthful and being honest, a lot of general managers would probably regret things that they did in haste um, or out of desperation. Um, it doesn't always work out. And, you know, some of that is free agent signings on July 1st, um, you know, that, that mistakes get made. And we know the Winnipeg Jets were very quiet this year uh, on that front. So they haven't really done anything in terms of signings that they're going to regret. Perhaps they'll regret signings that they didn't make. But, um, you know, patience is uh, a benchmark of the Kevin Sheveldayoff slash Winnipeg Jets 2.0 era. And, you know, I, I guess we shouldn't be surprised that, uh, that that hasn't changed, despite what we would all agree, I think, after last season, would be fairly desperate times for this organization. You know, I... Whispering I, I, sweet I, nothings I, into my ear. Yeah, she's saying, oh, I thought maybe she had a trade proposal or something for you. Right. That day, what she yeah, wanted this to, just to, in, to insiders. By the way, the chat has now referred to this segment as Piper's Pit. So um, uh, right. I uh, <laughs> certainly do love it. Um, Mike, the, the one thing that I'll, I'll say about uh, about the Jets' predicament is that the Central Division really looks like it is going to be, um, I mean, there's a few teams that if it's possible to take more of a step back from where they were, it's happened right. with, certainly with the Chicago Blackhawks. Arizona is in the mix. I'm not sure what Dallas is going to be this year. And... The St. Louis Blues, I think, you know, pretty much you would think are going to be a lock to be a playoff team. Um, and then the Nashville Predators, I mean, they're big move. They did get Ryan McDonough. They managed to re-sign Philip Forsberg. But there is that sort of muddy middle. We talk about the muddy middle around the National Hockey League. I think if you kind of ranked all the teams 1-32, to 32, a good portion of that muddy middle happens to reside in the Central Division south of the Colorado Avalanche, the Stanley Cup champs. Yeah, and don't discount uh, playing in a division with both Chicago and Arizona, who, you know, when the dust settles, uh, might be, they might be the two worst teams in the league. Uh, certainly expect them to be in the Connor Bedard conversation, uh, you know, by, by next spring, Huss. Um, so don't discount the, the, the uh, playing in a division where you get to beat up on those teams. Of course, Every other central division team will will get to see those teams plenty as well, uh, but you know it's it's funny like this is the time of year when you're starting to see, you know, state of the franchise uh, rankings coming out and and off season reports and quite a bit of what I've read about the Jets, I would characterize it as this: people maybe outside of this market aren't as down, it seems, on the the team and the prospects as maybe a lot of us are. I don't know if it's just a matter of... Or Piper. You know, just, yeah, I don't know if it's a case of where we just... Um, we're so used to, you know, what we've seen from this team and maybe we take certain things for granted that outsiders, you know, when they look at some of the talent that the Jets still have, guys like Kyle Connor, Nikolai Ehlers, and... Mark Shifley, um, you know, poised perhaps for a big rebound year. And Connor Hellebuck, of course, which when you got a Connor Hellebuck in net, you got a chance to win any game, right? So I get the sense that people outside this market look at the Jets and their chances a little more favorably than maybe a lot of fans and even media here in this market do. Yeah, no, I'll agree with that. Um I think part of them may be less aware of maybe the things that happened around the club, but many of the conversations we were having about, you know, that, you know, changes needed for a number of reasons Um, that obviously hasn't happened yet. The one thing, and just before we get to the bombers and some of the other things coming out of the weekend, Mike, the one reason why I think I'm the most surprised 
is maybe not necessarily even from a hockey decision. Now, you should never be making your hockey decisions based on what it's going to do to fire up fans. But I think that there was a reckoning coming for this team coming out of 2019 that got pushed back for two years basically because of the pandemic. Um, And right now, the organization is in a situation where for the first time, I mean, they are working hard. I would think, I know they've hired a bunch of people. I mean, they actually have reminds me of, you know, when it was back there working for the moose and we were trying to say, you know, we're making calls and talking to people and trying to sell season tickets. Um, The fact that there hasn't been a lot, like I've often put myself in the position of one of those young people selling seats are when you're calling people in and like, what is the, what is the message? I mean, what is the sales pitch on people other than, Hey, we've got an NHL team. You, games are great. We want to come to do it. And I thought that maybe something would be done almost more to energize the organization and the fan base. Right. And as I said, yeah. maybe this goes back to the, the, the whole point that I said, you can't make a deal for reasons other than trying to make your hockey team better. And they haven't found one that makes sense for them, but I think it's compounded the challenges in the market for the organization right now through an off season that, you know, there was the potential that I think certainly starting with Barry Trotz, that they could have done something that I think maybe changed the way people are thinking about the team could have helped them and helped the bottom line significantly. Well, for sure. And we saw, you know, and you, you were right in the middle of it, Huss, the, how fired up this fan base was for the potential of a Barry Trotz. And again, you can't oh, yeah. fault the Jets. You can't fault the Jets for for not landing Barry Trotz. It had nothing to do, um, you know, again, it's not like Barry Trotz went to another organization and the Jets finished second. Uh, he didn't go anywhere. Um, but, you know, so they tried for sure. We don't know necessarily what they may have tried in terms of big trades. Um, you know, we, we some some news has leaked out about a couple free agent signings that they've, you know, come up short on. I don't think those guys, you know, Kelly Yarncroc uh, wasn't going to move the needle one way or the other. I don't think anybody was rushing to buy season tickets if they got Kelly Yarncroc, um, you know, no offense to, to him. Um, Danton Heinen, same thing, right? Like, so, you know, have they tried some trades that other teams have shot down or they just haven't liked the return? I suspect, the answer to that is yes. Um, but again, and for the reasons you just outlined, Huss, Kevin Shevoldayoff can't be making moves just for the sake of making moves or just to try and move the needle at the box office, if you will, because that's a recipe, you know, to really make some mistakes and compound them that, that you soon regret. Um, but you're right. I mean, there's a challenge in this market uh, that COVID certainly exacerbated, but I think the bloom was already coming off the rose a bit. Now the question is, can they get it back to, you know, something pre pandemic in terms of, of fan interest and obviously attendance, um, you know, can they sell out a game this year? They didn't sell out any last year. We, we don't know the answer to that. Um, but so far, nothing the team has done off the ice uh, this summer would indicate that, that fans are flocking to see the product. Uh, but again, once the season starts and the puck drops, hey, winning winning can cure a lot of ails, right? And and if this team can string you know a decent start together, I suspect uh, it, it won't take long before we see you know. Let's face it, the Jets are still the number one property in this town. Win or lose, people you know eat, breathe, and sleep hockey in this market. So I'm not worried about the 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 long term viability or future of the Jets, um, but they have some work to do for sure. And nothing this summer has made that work any easier for sure. Well, just on that note, and again, I don't know the answer to this. I'm not suggesting that this is the case, but I think considering the summer that has just transpired, I think we have to ask the question, is there a chance that the business situation and the support, the you know, the lost season tickets and whatnot has changed Kevin Sheveldayoff's situation with what he's able to do? I mean, I think there was always the thought that this was going to be a cap team. Um, right. Might that not be the case anymore because of the fact that uh, what's coming in wasn't what it was a few years ago? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the pipeline is still pretty solid. If you look at at the last few drafts, like there, there's reason to be optimistic about kind of the longer term future and and some of the, the young players that will, you know, hopefully form the next core. Um and, and I think they like what they have here in terms of 
of, you know, the current core that is a mix, obviously, of some older guys like Blake Wheeler and even Mark Shifley. And then you're, you do Bois and Connors and, and Ehlers and then guys like Cole Perfetti and Billy Heinola. Like there's a number of tiers right now in this franchise. And I go back to the idea of kind of picking a lane and that this is a team that it felt like they were at a crossroads last season and they, they had a number of ways that they could go. And right now, Huss, it just feels like they're trying to go in every direction. Um, I think at some point still, though, they're going to have to choose a lane. Um, and if if that means maybe a, a more of a teardown rebuild, I think as long as they communicate that to the fan base, to the market, I don't think this market would turn on that idea. Um, I just think that when there's this continued state of mediocrity, and if the end result is, you know, you're just constantly fighting for a wild card playoff spot, but you're never really getting a really good draft pick, but you're also not really a contender. Like, I think that is maybe what people have a harder time investing in. And I've certainly heard from a lot of fans that agree that they feel the same way. Look, if this team would just pick a direction, we'd get behind it. But they feel kind of aimless right now. So to me, one thing I'll be looking forward to this, this you know, in a couple of weeks when camp gets underway is the messaging. Like, what is the message from Kevin Sheveldayoff? What is the message, obviously, from the new coaching staff? And what is the message from the players here? Um, right now, the message just seems to be, be patient. And we think we're better than we were last year. And we're hoping that, uh, that by almost running it back, we can have some different results. And time will tell if that's going to be the case. Yeah, no doubt about it. Mike McIntyre with us. Well, uh, I mean, hey, uh, we'll find out one way or the other. A couple weeks away from, uh, you know, getting the rookies here in camp and then training camp happening, hearing from Kevin Sheveldayoff, hearing from Rick Bonus, And obviously, we've heard from Mark Shifley, but hearing from a number of the other players. And just quickly on Cole Perfetti, as you mentioned, I mean, what a opportunity that he's in. But also, I would suggest a lot of pressure on Cole Perfetti to, you know, perform at a top six level, Mike, because... I mean, we're looking at the way this roster is put together right now, including Blake Wheeler in the top six, and your sort of right. big four of Shafley, Dubois while he's here, Ehlers and Connor. Cole Perfetti is that guy right now. And, yeah. I mean, you can pretty much say he's got that spot in the top six. Um, he doesn't have a ton of NHL experience. He looked good at times, but, I mean, certainly didn't explode as a rookie. Um He's going to have a huge, huge hand in the success of this team. And uh, I'd imagine he'll be playing a lot. And um, fairly or unfairly, a lot's going to be put on his young shoulders when the puck drops. Well, Huss, you'd probably know the answer to this better than I. Uh, what's the what's the going rate right now on him as a Calder Cup um, favorite? Because this is a guy that is still Calder Trophy. As a, I, I don't think Calder he's going to win. Nothing. I hope he doesn't win the Calder right. Cup Calder, for the Manitoba right. Moose. That would be a terrible season for him. We that need him in the be. NHL. <laughs> the uh, but I got to think, Huss, that he will be. You know, he's got to be a a Calder Trophy favorite. He's still a rookie by NHL definitions. And when you look at the Jets roster right now, like who's he starting on a line with? Is he playing? Is he going back to where he was, you know, before he got hurt last year with with Kyle Connor and Pierre-Luc Dubois? Uh, he looked really comfortable on that right wing. And if he's not playing there, then I suspect, you know, are we seeing him with Mark Scheifele and Nikolai Ehlers? Um, it seems like a win-win, you know, regardless of where he's playing, but it's it certainly would bode well if Cole Perfetti can come and certainly he said all the right things in terms of his health. Like this is a guy Haas who told me he was never healthy. Even when he, even before he got hurt his shoulder last year, he was dealing with a nagging back issue that flared up as he was rehabbing the shoulder. And he said in a way, maybe it was almost a blessing, like very frustrating that it cost him the rest of the year, obviously that he couldn't play with the moose in the playoffs uh, he didn't even go to the World Juniors, of course, a few weeks ago with Canada. Um, but he said maybe it's a blessing in disguise. We got the back sort of dealt with, cleaned up. And he said he feels great. Mark shifley has been working out with him this summer in Michigan, uh, raved about his condition. So if Cole Perfetti comes, like this is a guy who he was a absolute stud in the Ontario Hockey League. We know he's capable of, of putting up points. If he can come in and and start off this this new season the way that he seems to think he can and i think a lot of 
folks in the organization believe he can, uh, that that's you know that's a wild card that could certainly help the Jets uh, and be you know a difference maker for sure. But it is a lot of pressure to put on the on the shoulders of uh, of a young player like Perfetti, who's still a rookie. You know, I mean, uh, there was a lot of people that are like, excited about the uh, Ehlers Shifley Perfetti combination. Yeah. The first thing that comes to my mind, though, what the hell happens when the other team has the puck and they're in the Jets? End? <laughs> because of that, friends, um, I mean, with all due respect to all of those players, I mean, I don't think we'd say uh, defense, uh, defensive aptitude is high on the list of uh, right. any of those players. And again, Cole, the jury's out. I mean, still a very young guy. Um, but as much as the, the offensive potential is tantalizing, some of the biggest problems the Jets have had is keeping the puck out of their own net. And I'll be honest, I'd be a little surprised if Rick Bonus went that went that way because of the way that he's going to try to have the Winnipeg Jets play. And there's going to be some big changes, I think, for some players that maybe haven't played that way in the past. If if that is going to be the way the Winnipeg Jets are going to turn around from the the team that was last season to a team that does much better this year. Well, I'll say this, Huss, uh, that first day of uh, of training camp in a few weeks, like there'll be a lot of interest in what the what the line combos look like, you know, the first first time they put together some rushes. And I, I'm sure Rick Bonus will probably say, well, don't read too much into them. But I think we will be reading a lot into them uh, because I'm fascinated to see what his mindset is. Does he put does he try to put, you know, two offensive players with a more defensive type of player and balance what the Jets have? Like we talk about the guys that we think is in the top six, but does he spread those guys out and make a top nine and, you know, try and create three balanced scoring lines? I think if you look at the way he ran things in Dallas, there was more of that clear divide, like loading up one line and then, having a real checking defensive line. But I wonder if that will be his approach or if he will try to spread things out so that there's maybe no glaring weaknesses on any given line, but you're not putting all your eggs in in one or two baskets. So, you know, that's that's part of the new coaching regime that will be very interesting to watch here as camp gets underway. No doubt about it. Mike McIntyre's with us. Well, we'll kick this around for the next couple of weeks and then uh, see what happens when the puck drops. I just laugh about everyone freaking out about line combos in the first scrimmage of day one of training camp. But you are exactly right. That That is going to happen. And I will be as guilty as anybody of it right here with everybody on Winnipeg Sports Talk. A couple things I want to get to before we run. Um, Chris Strebler. Uh, Listen, I knew he was up in, in, you know, in a tough situation when you've got Zach Wilson, a number two overall pick, that will obviously be the right. starter. Joe Flacco, the veteran backup, and a third stringer in Mike White that threw for over 400 in his debut last year for the Jets. But what a story, the preseason that he's had. I mean, every single Jets game, you see them gushing over Strev. I mean... What do you think the chances are that he is on the active roster, which would mean presumably beating out one of those quarterbacks, probably Mike White. And does he go to the practice roster elsewhere as what he's done, you know, kind of being the guy in the preseason open up enough eyes that there'll be another NFL job for him. If he's not lucky enough to be on that roster, apparently he needs three more games for the NH NFL pension. So, you know, right. It's big for him <laughs> to get on that roster for a few more games, regardless of, what happens long-term this season? Well, it's a terrific story and a guy that, you know, always seems to have a lot of fun doing what he's doing. And, you know, to, to watch now the Jets fan base kind of fall in love with him. Uh, we saw that obviously here yeah. in Winnipeg and, you know, what he brought. It, it's, it's a great story. It's absolutely a great story. As always, I think you have to caution, you know, he's coming in. I, I, look, I'm not trying to rain it all over what he's done. He's coming in in the fourth quarter, so he's playing against the other teams, you know, presumably their third or fourth stringers as well. Um, but I have to think, Haas, that he's, you know, and just looking at some of the comments that have come from other players on that team and and the coaching staff, like, he's clearly opened some eyes. And I got to think he's forcing maybe some real tough decisions that they didn't think they were going to have to make. And if the Jets don't want him or don't have a spot for him, I have to think, Huss, that there is going to be another team that, that 
believes, you know, he could at worst be our third, our number three option. And we could use him and maybe create um, a system around this guy that could play to his strengths and really tap into him and tap into the, you know, the, the fan momentum that he's built in, in the market as well. Like that's, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of Strebler jerseys that, that would be sold uh, if he makes the Jets. And if he doesn't make the Jets, there's got to be another team that says, hey, we could use a guy like this around here. So great story, great, great guy, obviously. And uh, it's been a lot of fun to watch for sure. Well, and, and listen, we know what Streb's uh, skill set is. I mean, he's a very unique player. I mean, he's a unicorn right. in some ways. I mean, the way that he runs the football. Hell, this is a team that had Tim Tebow on their team for a little while and yeah. actually played him. I, I guess my argument why, even if you think Mike White has a better chance of being a starting quarterback in the National Football League, if I'm the head coach of this team, seeing what he's done so far and knowing what he's able to do, running the football, short yardage, those sort of things, yeah. To me, he brings more to the table as a third string guy that can come into a game and spot For duty sure. than a guy that's just simply holding a clipboard. And, you know, it's selfishly, I mean, I think, well, maybe not selfishly, but, you know, for his best interest and, you know, everyone wanting to see him get a chance and, you know, certainly be on that roster. I think that would be um, something that we'll look for going into final cuts coming up this week. All right, before we go, the question of the day coming out of the weekend. Yes. I'm sure you're familiar with one Carlos Jong's heroics at Southwood on the weekend. He I had sure am, yes. A hole in one, an eagle, and an albatross <laughs> in the same round. The question for you, Mike, is is Ken Weave on the hot seat now with like two holes in one? And I'm not sure. I think in, in the chat, you tell me, I think having two holes in one in a round is just one of those statements that is so incredible that I think I'd probably go with that. But right. I'm not sure that what Mr. Zhang did at Southwood in the club championship on the weekend with an albatross, a hole in one, and an eagle in the same round might not be, if it's possible, even more ridiculously unlikely than what our friend Weaver did at Glendale a few years back. So... This is not to uh, discount what Kenny did at all, but I, I'm going to make a very controversial statement here, Haas. I think an albatross is even tougher than a hole in one. I think if you make an alb let uh, an albatross a two on a five, that's essentially a hole in one, but on a par four, right? That's tougher. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> so it's like you know because your your tee shots out of the way, and then you're sinking. And I can't remember what his distance was uh, on, to, you know, to drain his two on the five the other day. But to me, the albatross, that's more rare and more difficult than even a hole in one. But to combine the albatross with a hole in one, that's almost better than two hole in ones. And then you had another eagle on top of that. Like Hus, he went seven under par on those three holes. Like has anybody... When's the last time someone at any level of golf had a three hole, you know, where you could pick their three best holes in a round of golf and say that they were seven under like two hole in ones, you're four under on those two holes. Now you need an albatross as well to get to seven under on three. So I think uh, all respect in the world to Kenny, I think Kenny's double aces is now the second greatest local golfing achievement uh, behind this one. I, I, I'm, I've I'm been talking about it all weekend. I had a beer with a buddy that was playing at Southwood was in the, and was in the, in the club championships. And a couple of his pals were in the group with, uh, with Carlos Young. And uh, I mean, it is just <laughs> simply legendary. Uh, yes. We can weave Carlos Young. We can all achieve, we can all aspire to have one magical round like <laughs> the fellas did. And uh, ah, that, that, that story's never going to get old. I don't know what's in the water here, but uh, wow. Well, what do you have coming up? Uh, of course, we got Riders uh, Bombers this week. I know you mentioned you're writing about the fish who have clinched the playoffs. We're going to yeah. talk to Andrew Collier in a second about that. And uh, I imagine still, although you must really be scratching for Jets topics right now because there's not a lot to be <laughs> said that we haven't said plenty of times over the last little while it's about time to get these guys on the ace and get uh, on the ice and get to it 
Well, and to that extent, Cole Perfetti told me he'll be in town on September 8th, and he said a lot of the guys are going to be here around then. So we don't even have to wait till training camp because there'll be a big contingent of Jets skating in basically a week from now or just over a week, Huss. Um, so uh, there should be some fresh storylines out of that. But yeah, that for me, I just work in a couple of days this week and then off to do the, the house renos um here so uh looking forward to that and uh, the long weekend of course and the fish they as you'll hear from andrew collier the plan is gold eyes will actually open the playoffs at home next week so they're for sure getting one playoff game which should be next wednesday looking forward to that i'll be there to cover that as well Huss. great stuff mike thanks for doing this have a great week <laughs> good luck with the renos i hope your marriage is still intact when you join us next week on the program <laughs> Yes, indeed. Well, as you've seen, we're also going to have to find a way to corral uh, Piper as well, because she makes work a little difficult. Work from home with a, a, a curious one-year-old pup is quite the adventure. Well, she was a star of the show today. That is for sure. Mike, indeed. thanks so much for doing this. Have All a right. great one. You bet. Take care. Good stuff. There's Mike McIntyre from the Winnipeg Free Press. Yeah, we are going to get an update on the fish coming up right away with our guy Andrew Collier. Before we do that, folks, you know, it's that time of the year, summer's coming to an end. You might be thinking, geez, another Winnipeg winter coming up. I need to step up my wheels. And uh, if you are looking for a new vehicle, go directly to our friends over at Not Auto Corp and talk to one of the experts there about getting into an upgraded whip for the summer, for the winter. Of course, Not Auto Corp has an incredible selection of amazing vehicles on the lot. But if there's a specific make and model you're looking for, the experts at Knot can identify it, get it here to Winnipeg at the best possible price, and get you in it just in time for the snow to fall. Why not get into the car of your dreams at a great price with the help of the Knot team? Pop down and see them, Waverly and McGilvery, or check them out online at Knot.ca. I'm sure all of you maybe uh, mixed in a 19, 19 or two over the course of the weekend. Of course, Little Brown Jug, the uh, 1919 are all their amazing summer beers. You see them everywhere as the top local brewery here in Manitoba. Uh, but I'll tell you what, we are going to be having some fun with our friends at Little Brown Jug. I can't believe it's coming up this quickly. This Thursday night, 7 o'clock, yours truly hosting our first ever Winnipeg Sports Talk Sports Trivia Night. I spent the majority of Saturday afternoon curating questions lots of local content as well as general sports so i'm really looking forward to it if you're with us on youtube right now i've just put in the link for the uh, for the tickets for the event and again uh, essentially the ticket is uh, just you buy your first beer uh, with the ticket you'll get a free beer when you come there and it's just so we can uh, have a pretty good idea of head count very limited space left so Folks, would love to see you there. It'll be a big WST get-together, and it should be a heck of a lot of fun. Thursday night, Little Brown Jug, Eventbrite link in the chat and in the description of the program. Get on that, and we will see you on Tuesday night. And Of course, you can get the great taste of Little Brown Jug at your favorite local beer store or at Little Brown Jug on William Avenue, where we'll be Thursday night as well as you can order online at littlebrownjug.ca. A big thanks to our friends Nick and Nikki for their great support of Winnipeg Sports Talk. And, man, they're doing some great things in the community. I know Nick was a sponsor of the St. James Canucks Tournament last week, supporting the uh, local squad out on the west side of the city. And they're also involved in the Canadian Mid-Am and Senior Women's Championships that begin tomorrow at Breezy Bend. But even better, they're the spot where you can go for the delicious blizzard with the new summer flavors, the Kit Kat blizzard, the Reese's Pieces cookie dough, and of course, the amazing stack burgers as well. Four locations in Winnipeg and Southern Manitoba, DQ Niverville, DQ Northgate, DQ Polo Park, and DQ St. Anne's. And uh, hit them up on Instagram as well at DQ Manitoba. Give them a follow and uh, you can get a custom cake made for an event going forward. You can pick it up quick and easy at any of the four nick and nikki dq locations all right baseball season far from over in winnipeg the gold eyes are headed to the playoffs and are back to finish up the home schedule with a pretty extended homestand let's bring in the general manager of the fish andrew collier to the program what's up cash uh, the boys are back and uh, you guys are making plans for the playoffs how are you Oh, you know what? I 
let's just make sure we can oh, no we that lost was me mic that, there we go was, there we go sorry he's about that. back <laughs> how's it going I, playoff I, bound. I i muted my mic because i didn't want to talk over uh mr mcintyre you know well, it's uh, it's all good. You were back. We can hear you. And uh, I imagine the uh, the front office is buzzing, uh, both with the team coming back from what was going to be a season-ending homestand, but knowing that you're also planning for postseason baseball. Yeah, we're getting ready. We have seven regular season games left. Get primed up for playoffs starting next week. It's looking like September 7th will be game one, I guess, Anything could happen. Last time I was on, we talked about the format. The number one team picks their opponent of the other three teams that qualify. But if I had to guess, then uh, we're probably going to be opening at home uh, as the third seed in in our division. Um, as far as that goes, fill us in because the playoffs are expanded. So we've got four teams in each division. You mentioned that really interesting quirk where – Team number one gets to choose who they play. That will be something for certainly for us to talk about. Um, but what is the format of the playoffs? How long are the series? Um, and, and how does the home and away work? Because you know you're trying to limit the amount of travel considering how far it is from some of these um, locations that you may be going up against. Yeah, so there's two. The first two rounds are best of three. And then the championship championship series is a best of five. So we will play, I'm guessing, either Fargo or Kansas City, starting to look like Kansas City in the first round, and then the uh, two winners in our division play off in a best of three to decide the division winner, and then they go on to play in a best of five against the uh, East Division winner. Well, first things first, though, you got to finish off the uh, the home schedule, and um you know, this is a long one. It's been a, it was a ten day a roadie, so we haven't been back since two weeks ago. But um, once again, you're playing a team that you've seen a lot of lately. Kansas City, who's got a pretty good squad, a three game homestand beginning tonight for uh, for the team, and a day off Thursday, and then back at it against Sioux Falls for uh, for the Labor Day long weekend. Yeah, we've seen a lot of KC lately, and and it's starting to look like we'll see them in the first round of the playoffs as well. If if things uh, go as I think they will. So, uh, yeah, very familiar with Kansas City. But, yeah, seven home games left for people that haven't been out to the ballpark yet this year and season's winding down, summer's winding down, and want to get out to a game. They've got seven more regular season games to get out to and, and hopefully an extended playoff run. When um when will you know? I mean, about the playoffs. I mean, at, at certain, I'm sure you guys are selling tickets right now. I mean, with your ticket holders, or if people want to get set for a playoff game, they can do that. Um, but I'd imagine right now, I mean, go to the games that you guys have have this week, uh, because it could be a pretty quick turnaround to knowing the date of those of that playoff game as soon as the regular season is over. Yeah, the, our division isn't settled yet. Fargo has a three-game lead over Kansas City. There's still seven games to go, and Kansas City and Fargo finish up with three games against each other. So Kansas City could grab that number one seed, but uh, it's it's looking like Fargo's got that top seed and and uh, starting to look like we'd play KC and Fargo would play Sioux City. But, hey, Anything can happen until the league tells us who we're playing. We won't really know, but we're kind of planning on September 7th will be our first game. All right. Andrew Collier from the Winnipeg Gold Eyes is with us. You can get more information on that goldeyes.com. Make sure you're following him on Twitter at WPG underscore Gold Eyes for the latest announcements of the club. The big story on the weekend was Max Murphy. Three bombs, one over the scoreboard in Fargo right now. And I, I mean, I was at a game a few weeks ago and I was just looking at his numbers on the season and I was texting you. I'm like, where does this rank with the best seasons in gold eyes history? And now I mean, he's just under 300 for the season, 29 home runs and 90 RBIs. Um, we're getting into pretty rarefied air right now for the season that he's having. And he's only tied for the home run lead on the team. Yeah, he's had some great years for us, and he's kind of been overshadowed by Kyle Martin the last couple of years with what he did, and and which was incredible. But 
with 29 home runs. He's only two home runs shy of what Kyle did last year. Uh, Kyle had 106 RBI, so he's Max has got some work to do on the on the RBI front, but he's only two home runs back of what Kyle did last year for us, and 33 home runs is the league record, and Adam Brett Walker said that last year. Yeah, we're uh, well. We'll see. I mean, lots to lots to play for coming up. I mean, imagine if you could get another four bombs and ten RBIs over these final ten games. I mean, not uh, we'd be uh, we'd be talking about uh, Reggie Abercrombie type fame for uh, for Max here in the peg. Maybe not quite that much, but listen. Overall, it's a great team. How are you feeling about the squad right now uh, going into this final homestand? Um, you know, it's sort of been up and down playing good teams over the last little while. Uh, but before that, had a really good run to really establish yourself as a contender. Um, what's uh, what's at stake for the team in these final seven games? And uh, where are you looking to, uh, if anything, maybe shore things up before things really count in the postseason? I think it's just a matter of maybe getting some guys some rest, give Rick a chance to, to get his starting rotation lined up. Our bullpen's been pitching really well lately. Um, I'd put them up against any bullpen in the league right now. So it's just a matter of making sure we're in good shape heading into the playoffs. And just like we were in 2012 and 2016, I think we'd be considered underdogs going into this first round, no matter who we play and things turned out all right in, in 12 and 16. Yeah, no, that's uh, (laughs) that's exactly right. Well, I can tell you, I went to a number of games on the last homestand and if my consumption of the amazing concessions at the ballpark or any indication um i'm in playoff form right now ready to go but i will continue pushing the envelope over the course of the next little while probably tweeting out a few beauties for you well at hustler hour from the game and cash i will very much not only be looking forward to seeing you this week at the ballpark but seeing you for some playoff baseball out at shaw park up once again Keep your eyes on the website and the Twitter feed, goldeyes.com, at WPG underscore goldeyes for information on tickets. But in the meantime, uh, just give us a quick uh, preview of uh, this final homestand for uh, for folks and when they can come out and see the squad. Yeah, so tonight, tomorrow, uh, Wednesday, against Kansas City, all three games are at 6.30. We have a player card giveaway, the first 500 tonight, player card set. Uh, and then tomorrow and Wednesday at 6.30, and then Sioux Falls comes to town for Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Friday, 6.30, Saturday, 6 o'clock, Sunday and Monday, both at 1 o'clock, fireworks on Saturday night, uh, team photo giveaway on Monday, should be uh, should be a great homestand. Like I said, if you haven't been out this summer, come on down, check it out. We've got a new lineup at Craft Beer Corner, including your big sponsor little brown jug they're at craft beer corner as well as their 1919 and golden ale is available in cans every game so yeah come on down check it out beautiful shout out to brett best beer guy in the biz still doing his thing and uh, yeah we did clean them out of hefeweizen at the last game i was at so i get there early get your spot at craft beer corner and enjoy what gold ice baseball is all about cash thanks for doing this we'll see at the park this week thanks Huss. thanks for having me and we'll see at the park you got it. Uh, there he is, Andrew Collier. Give him a follow as well on Twitter at GoldEyesGM. There's Andrew Collier. All right. Uh, still a few more things to do before we finish up the program, folks. And I do want to thank Princess Auto. We'll have uh, lots of Princess Auto bomber reports this week. Getting ready for the Labor Day Classic. And then, of course, the Banjo Bowl the following week. Banjo Bowl is already sold out. Many of you are going to make a plan to get there early. Take in everything that the Banjo Bowl includes in that is the princess auto tailgate zone should be bananas before the game five dollar beers 350 pop and hot dogs um great entertainment from our guy dj finesse and prizes as well from the princess auto team and don't forget i'll be live at princess auto for the show on thursday with some very special guests from the world of curling looking forward to that um, getting ready for the Labor Day game. Of course, we'll have bomber reports throughout the week as the team gets back on the practice field, getting ready for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. And Princess Auto is the place where you'll find the best deals and the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around. Everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new 
is at Princess Auto. Two Winnipeg locations, Panet Road, Portage Avenue West, but you can always shop online 24-7, 365 over at princessauto.com. And hey, speaking of that Princess Auto tailgate and bomber games, uh, if you have not already tried the delicious Canadian Club and Ginger Ale ready-to-drink pre-mix cocktail, you can grab one at the game because, of course, Canadian Club is the official spirit and official sponsor of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. And it's not just Canadian Club filling up those Ryan Cokes at the game. You can also get the canned CC and ginger available throughout IG Field. And I imagine there'll be quite of those going down at the Banjo Bowl coming up in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, though, pick it up in six packs at your local beer store. And, of course, you can get the great taste of Canadian Club, the iconic Canadian whiskey, at your local Manitoba Liquor Marts. All right, we do have to get to Assiniboia Downs. I've got some picks for you. See what Remus is doing. I know he'll be getting his picks on the road. He'll probably be watching the races as well on uh, he'll probably be watching them as well on YouTube from wherever he is right now. Uh, but let's get to the cool bet lines right now because we've got another big, well, one of the biggest weekends of the year in the Canadian Football League, and we've got some lines out right now. We'll start it off with the game uh, that kicks off the weekend. Ottawa coming off that win in Edmonton, taking on the Montreal Alouettes, who, by the way, Gary Stern, who joined us on the program a little while ago, has stepped down as the um, CEO of the Montreal Alouettes and is no longer on the CFL Board of Governors. And, you know, his partner, who had had 75% of the team passed away, that's in control of the estate. So, unfortunately, sounds like another CFL team looking for a new owner. That being said, Alouettes, five-and-a-half-point favorites Friday night against Ottawa. Coming up Sunday, it's the annual Labor Day Classic. Bombers and Riders and Winnipeg has opened as three-and-a-half-point favorites over Saskatchewan. Riders getting three-and-a-half points at home. Bombers on the money line, minus 192, and plus 158 for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. And then Labor Day, the tradition continues. East game, Argos tie cats again. Argos got that big win on the last weekend. Hamilton now at home in this one. One-point favorites out of the gate. And then the Battle of Alberta, Edmonton still can't win at home. 1,052 days now and counting since a win for the Elks at Commonwealth Stadium. Well, maybe they'll have better luck going down the uh, down the number two to Calgary. Calgary Stampeders, 12-point favorites over Edmonton in the Battle of Alberta. And just in case you were wondering, Bombers, uh, the Bomber line for winning the Grey Cup, went down significantly since BC lost Nathan Rourke. Bombers plus 129, BC 4-1, to one, Calgary 5-1, to one, Saskatchewan and Toronto plus 750. Uh, in the majors tonight, we don't have a ton going on. Always a little bit of a, uh, a, 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 a you know, shorter schedule day. Uh, but the Blue Jays are in action tonight. They need a win. As we talk with Skyler off the top of the program, very ugly three-game sweep to the Angels on the weekend. The Angels of all teams. Uh, but good news, the Cubs stink, and they are coming to town. Jays minus 227 favorites tonight, minus 115 on the run line to win by two. Other games tonight, including the Cards, Reds, Dodgers, Marlins, Red Sox, Twins. Twins a minus 118 favorite over Boston. Uh, Pittsburgh and the Brewers and the Yankees, Angels, and Phillies, and Diamondbacks, Padres, Giants as well. Other series get going tomorrow in the majors uh, as well. Hey, one other thing I should get to. Um, today, Serena Williams gets out on the court at the U.S. Open, uh, but U.S. Open draws have begun. First round continues right now. We'll keep you up to date. Maybe bring John Horn on a little bit later on this week for a look at where all of the Canadians are. Uh, but it is certainly a great, great time for tennis fans with the best coming to Arthur Ashe Stadium in Queens getting going. Of course, Cool Bet is the place to go if you want to sprinkle on the games. And if you haven't played there before, use the promo code WST for a 100% bonus on your first deposit up to $200. And if you like winners, 
Join myself and Dustin Nielsen tomorrow. We'll be making our CFL picks. 4-0 and last week, 7-1 and against the number in the last two weeks. Things are rolling well coming in to Labor Day weekend for yours truly. All right, let's get to Assiniboia Downs. Live racing is back tonight. Lots going on on the west side of the city. You got the Canadian Mid-Am and Seniors Women's Championship at Breezy Bend, and then maybe finish that up and head on over for a great meal at Assiniboia Downs and check out the live racing with the gang. You can make an appointment eight or make a reservation, 885-3330 if you want to get in on that world-famous prime rib buffet and bet in the races from the dining room or pop in free parking, free admission anytime uh, when there's live racing. All right, let's see what I've got today. I made the picks a little earlier. Uh, we've got plenty of, uh, you know that I always go with the wit horses. Um, so here we are, race number two tonight. Uh, we're going to go with Wits 1010. That is a go-to. If you see Wit in the horse, I'll go with number two. Uh, in the third race, we're going to go with number three, Say It All. A little bit more of a long shot. Uh, when we get to race number four, uh, Wit and Whiskey, count me in on that. Four to one opening line. Uh, then we'll move over to Race number five. This is where I'm going to go with the Triactor Box, $1 wager, Bombili Gato, Aniar, and Jenna's Gun Runner. Those are the three favorites. I'm not sure it'll be a big win, but hopefully it is a win because God knows I need it. And then in race number six, Wit Nine with Chavian Chow on, on the on the uh, ride, four to one, the opening line. I need some wins. Oh, and our other favorite horse, Fat and Bitter, is also there. Maybe I'll have to add in a Wit9 Fat and Bitter Quinella as well. HPIBet.com is the spot where you can bet on a Cinnaboy Downs if you're not able to make it out. And don't forget, you can watch Kirk Stretch and the gang do their thing. 6.30, before all the races, they'll do a full rundown and uh, give their thoughts on the races. And then throughout the evening, previews, picks, and more and all the great sights and sounds from the Downs if you can't make it out on the YouTube channel at AssiniboyaDowns.com. Well, what an excellent show today. Um, big thanks to Skylar Peters. He was just phenomenal. I'm a huge fan of Skylar's. Had so much fun working with him when he was interning with us back at 1290, and it's great to see him doing so well. Although, to be honest, when you hear how great he is talking sports, I'm not sure whether they're getting the most of him on the news beat right now. But um, anyways, that's someone else's ball to play. All I know is it was great to have Skylar join us today on the show to uh, chop it up on a whole bunch of things. And of course, Mike McIntyre, but the star of the show, of course, was Piper. Um, podcast listeners might not know what we mean, but if you go to the YouTube channel, um, a cute little puppy certainly advances or certainly fires people up and can brighten up everyone's spirits. And that's exactly what Piper did while we were talking jets and more with Mike earlier today. And uh, gold eyes back in action tonight. Uh, listen, the rain seems like it's sort of stopped for the evening. Not the nicest of days, but uh, it's always a great time to go to the ballpark. So fish going at it tonight, uh, start of a three game series against Kansas city. They'll have a day off on Thursday and then finishing it off with a four game series with Sioux falls on the weekend and then playoff baseball next week. We know what's going to happen. We'll find out whether it's here in Winnipeg to start off or whether the team is on the road. Um, man, great stuff today. Uh, big show tomorrow. We're going to start really diving into both sides of the Labor Day Classic. I'm looking forward to getting Bomber on. and Maybe we'll try and do that tomorrow because I also want to get Darren on to talk about the game he called on the weekend, and that was the big win, 1916 for the Winnipeg Rifles over the Saskatoon Hilltops, who've just been uh, basically the standard in the uh, the Junior Football League. Um, so big win for the Rifles. We'll talk about that a little bit with Bomber and then get his thoughts on this upcoming matchup between Winnipeg and Saskatchewan. As I mentioned, Bomber's opening as three-and-a-half-point favorites on Cool Bet for the game on the weekend. Um Got a big shout out to everyone in the chat today. Um, you guys have helped us out big time. Alex has been doing a great job, but I love the way we sort of have been able to manage to take care of, uh, take everyone. <laughs> can we see Alex? Okay, trust me on this. Andrew, can we at least see Alex's driver's license or passport? No, we won't be showing out any personal information, but I can tell you, Alex, after doing such a great job 
bringing the marble race on a day where we didn't think it was going to happen, um, we will definitely have Alex on the program as we close out the week. Remus is going to be back on Friday. And I know I promised you Hacksaw today. Um, Hacksaw, unfortunately, couldn't make it. I had to go to a, a press conference down in San Diego. And this was one story, kind of an ugly story coming out of the weekend. Uh, but I should mention it right now. Uh, Matt Ariza, sixth round punter out of San Diego State, picked by the Bills, known as the punt god, uh, who routinely would crush 80-yard bombs, um, you know, was penciled in as the Bills punter for this season. He is um, facing civil charges on what is being accused of being a gang rape of a 17-year-old woman. Um, you know, he and his attorney have uh, denied the charges, but the Bills... Um, have realized that, I mean, I'm not sure whether how, when they found out about this or whether there's new details, but uh, there's no way that they can go forward uh, with this. Now, um, he's been released. Um, former BC punter Ty Long getting a look right now with the Bills. Um, so it might be a great opportunity for a former CFLer, uh, but just a really ugly story uh, coming out of the weekend from the National Football League. And of course, it being down in San Diego where Lee is and does his work. Had to go to that. So Hacksaw will join us. We'll do a full weekend preview with Hacksaw coming up on Friday when we usually have Lee on the program. Um, I think we'll have Jeff Hamilton. Marat's back off holidays, so I expect to have him as well on Wednesday. Reach out to our buddy Rod Peterson. Can't be Labor Day Classic Week without a talk with Rod, as well as more friends from Saskatchewan. And uh, we'll check in with the Bombers as well. Folks, great stuff today. Glad you were with us. Thanks so much for the support of Winnipeg Sports Talk. Tell a friend. And again, if you haven't already, make a point of joining us on Thursday night, uh, Little Brown Jug, for our first ever sports trivia night. One more time, I will throw it in the YouTube chat. Click that link. Get your tickets. Come on down and join us for what would be, uh, will be a really fun day. A few pints. Some great questions, talking Jets, Bombers, general sports, and more. And uh, it'll just be great to kind of have a de facto WST hangout as well. Um, huge thanks to Alex Allard making things happen while the brains of the operation is on the road. Thank you to Skylar Peters. Speaking of the brains of the operation, there you are. little, some dolphin swimming today. Man, Remus is really getting around. Safari on Friday, now swimming with the dolphins. And again, the good luck shirt to Mr. Dubsy. Shout out to Dubs for that. What did he win? Uh, 5K and seven uh, and a half thousand bucks as well on those golf bets. The WST bump is real. Remus is back though on Thursday. And of course, Andrew Collier and Mike McIntyre, in addition to Skylar Peters, who joined us today. And as always, thanks to the sponsors that make this show happen all the time. Lock shop tomorrow, CFL picks. We're red hot. It'll be at noon on Twitter, myself and Dustin Nielsen. And then we'll get at it. 1 p.m. with another edition of Winnipeg Sports Talk getting all over Labor Day week in the Canadian Football League and more. For Alex Allard and a vacationing Michael Remus, I'm Andrew Peterson. Special thanks to the people in the chat. We'll see you tomorrow at 1 p.m. Have a great night. We'll catch you then. Oh, my God. Oh! Oh! Shut it down. Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.